Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Very happy to, uh, to be here and to moderate uh, this um, uh, session on, on Yemen. Um, I'm standing in for April Ali, uh, the, um, our Yemen expert, along with Peter Salisbury, and my deputy is direct, program director for the Middle East and North Africa. She couldn't be here today, uh, but uh, she will be giving some recorded remarks uh, at the outset. So um, uh, April will be the first speaker on this panel, uh, followed by uh, Peter Salisbury, uh, who is the, our senior analyst for Yemen. Um, and then we have two external speakers, very happy to welcome them here. Uh, the first one is Natwa Dausari, uh, who is a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. And of course, uh, not only a Yemeni, but also a longtime Yemen observer. Um, followed by uh, uh, Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who uh, is a former ambassador, to, American ambassador to Yemen, and currently uh, serves as a distinguished professor at Georgetown University and the director of Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Um, every speaker will have about between five and 10 minutes to, to give a, a presentation. Um, and then we will open the, the floor for uh, question and answers. Uh, the call is being recorded and we will uh, distribute the link uh, afterwards. And the call is also being, uh, the event rather, is also being live streamed on Facebook. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, even throughout the presentations, you can send them in either to the, our email address webinars at crisisgroup.org um, or go to the Q&A in Zoom um, which, are, which is on mute, and you can type in your uh, questions there. So I am now, without further ado, going to April, who sent in a recorded message um, introducing the event. Good morning, or af good afternoon, and thank you for attending this report launch. This is a, a major uh, report for ICG. It's the product of a year and a half of extensive field work that included uh, four trips to Yemen, extensive field work throughout the Gulf, um, interviews in Amman and Cairo, European capitals, and in the United States. Uh, for us, it was very much a chance to take a step back um, after five years of war in Yemen and to ask what are the underlying assumptions what is the framework for, for mediating and into this conflict? Um, and what are the political and military realities on the ground in Yemen after five years of war? What is the gap between those two? And, and how do we bridge that gap? Our Yemen analyst, our lead Yemen analyst, uh, will provide much more information about our analysis and our, and our recommendations, followed by um, two experts um, who have extensive experience in Yemen and who we have learned a, a great deal from. Uh, in the end, when we did the research for this report, uh, we came up with, with two main conclusions. Um, first is that after five years of, of political and, and military fragmentation in the country, it's absolutely essential that more Yemeni parties um, have a formal role in the negotiations to end the war and, and to build peace. Secondly, uh, more than likely any political settlement is going to need to be a, a, have a bounded approach and a more gradual one that eschews a, a rapid recentralization in the capital of, of Sana'a in the hands of a few players um, and a rapid handover of, of, of weapons and instead focuses on securing a ceasefire, getting the economy running again, getting a streamlined government um, back in, 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 in Sana'a that recognizes some of the decentralized realities of the country. Now, why did we publish this report um, now? And it's really for two reasons. One, one has to do with the political opportunities that we see. Um, over the course of, of this long war, uh, we've seen an evolution in, in the conversation among Yemenis and among external policymakers on the requirements for peace. So we think that there is a moment of uh, political opportunity here that might find some resonance um, for our ideas. Um, but secondly, it's this issue of, of the risk, of the risk of continuing down the same path um, without a course change. 
Um, we've seen, again, after five years, now we're in our sixth year of war, um, that there is likely no nationwide military victor to this conflict. So while there's no guarantee of a military victory to end this war, there is a certainty of continued humanitarian suffering um, if this war continues. And of course, we all know that Yemen is the, the site of the, the worst humanitarian disaster um, globally right now. So this trajectory will continue with devastating consequences for the popula population um, and in the context of a combustible regional environment where additional regional spillover um, is likely. So there's an urgent need to, to revisit the framework, um, to understand uh, what is not working, what is what is, and then what needs to be changed. So with that, I will hand it back over to our uh, MENA director, Yost Tilterman. Thank you, April. And um, um, I move it straight on to Peter Salisbury, who is our senior Yemen analyst, uh, who will talk about the report that uh, our team has prepared over the past months. All right, thank you very much, Joost, and thank you to everyone on the call. You should be able to see um, my screen right now. Joost giving me the thumbs up, which is good news. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a, a, a few minutes, um, about five to, to seven, and just really quickly walk you through the questions that we asked going into this report, as April said, in the, the video, some of the, the research, some of our findings, and then circle back to more granular detail of some of the, the recommendations that we make in, in the, the report. So <clears throat> we, we started out quite some time ago with this report, about 18 months ago, um, with a set of really three basic questions. The first was, what is the, the current political framework for peace in, in Yemen? Secondly was, what's the situation on the ground? What, are the, what is the political and economic reality that we're dealing with in, in Yemen. Of course, how does the international peace, how do international interests play into that? And what is the relationship between this framework, which we've had for quite some time, and these new and evolving facts on, on the ground, which will, of course, shape, <clears throat> pardon me, whatever a settlement ends up being. So first and foremost, what, what's the current political framework for Yemen? Um, for those of you who are familiar with Yemen, it's, it's not that, that difficult of a question to answer. Um, we have UN, UN Security Council Resolution 2216 issued in March of 2015, um, shortly after um, the um, Saudi intervention into what was already a civil war between the Houthis um, and allies of President Saleh, former President Saleh on one side and their various rivals on the, the other side, including the internationally recognized government. Then in 2016, we had months of peace talks led by the UN, which led to a draft agree agreement, which has become the baseline for many parties for all subsequent talks. And we call that the, the Kuwait framework in the, the report. And the, the common feature of every subsequent um, set of negotiations has been two-party mediation with some international involvement. So between what was the houthi Saleh alliance, now the, the Houthis, since they, they killed Saleh in December of 2017 on the one hand, and the internationally recognized government led by uh, Abdurrahim Mansur Hadi on the, the other side, with some inclusion of other voices through Track 2 initiatives. So these sort of dialogues led by what, what, what are called Track 2 dialogue advisory groups, um, and women's advisory group, which works directly with uh, the UN, but two parties um, negotiating over the end to, to a war. Um, there are several central challenges to, to this framework. First are interpretations of 2216. There is increasing consensus that 2216 is not as binding as some people would argue. It does not necessarily limit um, peace talks to just the two parties named as being the key um, belligerents, but it has become convenient for the, the Houthis and the, the Hadi government in equal measure to present it as such, to say that there needs to be a deal between the, the two of them so as not to dilute their individual positions. But then the issue on top of this is the relative strength of the Houthis, who I will discuss in a little bit. Saudi Arabia, which is 
the main backer of the, the Hadi government and the Hadi government itself, um, where we see a, the Houthis strong on the ground and we see the Hadi government increasingly in a difficult position on, on the ground. And we see Saudi Arabia shifting its approach to, to Yemen over time. Um, and on top of that, that relative strength is the gap between the bargaining positions, which I'll discuss in, in a moment, and in particular, the exclusion of key armed and political groups who either were strong and important voices in the beginning of the conflict, have become important voices uh, over the course of the conflict, or would play an important role in the event of a settlement in ensuring the success of any settlement. So what we spent a lot of time doing over the past year and a half was first and foremost mapping the key political and territorial divisions on the ground and then reaching out to the main sort of hard power parties on the ground, but also local governance actors and also people like civil servants, people who made the country run, youth activists, people who work in civil society, people who work on localized peace building. And what we find is that you can roughly divide Yemen into five or so cantons of, of overall control and, and influence. So the Houthis in, in the Northwest, um, down there, the, the red patch in the Southeast, you have what we call the Hadrami military authorities who operate largely autonomously um, and find themselves caught between um, the internationally recognized government, which controls the, the biggest patch. So they're, they're in Al Jauf, they're in Marab, they're in Shabwa, they're in Abyan, they're, they control much of northern Hadramat and, and Al Mahra. Um, but the Hadrami authorities find themselves in a position where they operate pretty much autonomously, but then are caught between the government on one side and its allies, and the STC, the Southern Transitional Council, on the other, which controls um, Aden, uh, Lahej, or Lahej for the southerners on the call, uh, Adala, um, and now um, controls Hadiwo, the, the capital of Socotra Island out there in the, the Arabian Sea. And then on the Red Sea coast, we have the, the Joint Resistance Forces, led by Tariq Saleh, um, who pushed up the Red Sea coast in 2018, and have really built their own kind of beachhead in Mocha and are kind of the de facto authorities there. And then we have this, this pocket of land inside um, Tyres, which is controlled by um, government and government affiliated forces, but finds itself at odds with some of its, its nominal allies. So we have these, these kind of five areas of political military control across the country, but there's no consensus among all the different parties about what a political settlement would look like. And in fact, there are, of course, divisions among the different groups in each canton. And on top of that, we have the challenge of stopping the fight in the first place. This again isn't a conflict just between the Houthis on one side and the, the Hadi government on, on the other. It's a, <clears throat> a war between the Houthis and their allies on one side and a wide array of Yemeni actors. And we have nestled within this, this top line conflict, an additional emerging conflict between the STC who seized Aden in 2019, August 2019, and the, the government itself. So when we top them up, we see sort of uh, around um, seven or, or eight key front lines across the country, which you can read the report to, to see broken down, including um, the front line Abyan between um, the STC and the, the government of, of Yemen. So when it comes to stopping the war, when it comes to stopping the conflict, it's not as simple as calling military commander X and military commander Y, getting them to come together and work out a, a deal. You need all these different groups to feel that it's in their interest to, to work um, towards a, a deal. And what we've seen over the course of the conflict is Saudi Arabia increasingly being the, the party that tries to provide the glue to hold the various anti-Houthi parties together, to bring the anti-Houthi bloc to, together. At the same time though, we've really seen the atomization of, of that bloc. And the, the core challenge at the moment for, for Saudi Arabia as the main backer of the government, having intervened in the war early on, has really been trying to work out some sort of agreement between the STC and the government. They, they broke up something called the Riyadh Agreement last November, um, but that's been stalemated ever, ever since. Um, so we end up in this, this place where we've got lots and lots of different groups with different interests all over the country, different perspectives on, on what a political settlement looks like. 
Um, and when we talk to all the different parties, we'll, what we'll see is sort of, there, there are two core interests, groups that have achieved local autonomy, by and large, want to sustain that autonomy in the event of a political settlement. Whereas the Houthis and the, the Hadi government each have centralizing instincts. They would like to see a deal that brings power back to a single government, probably based in, in Sana'a, with all the challenges that that would bring in terms of seating a government in, in Sana'a, and then run the country from, from there. So whereas a lot of groups may, for example, support the, the government, place themselves under the government umbrella, like the local authorities in Marib, what we find, <clears throat> pardon me, is that the, the idea of a political settlement that leaves, for example, the Houthis in a position of relative strength within that government and sees power re-centralized in Sana'a would be a non-starter for, for them. And this really brings us back to this question of the, the relationship between the broad political framework that we've had for five years and the situation on, on the ground. So first and foremost, we see a lack of incentives for negotiation on the part of the Hadi government and the, the Houthis. Um, the Houthis at this moment in time may believe that time is on their side. As this war has continued, they consolidated their control over the northwest of Yemen. They managed to remove a series of internal threats. And in the past six months, they made a series of territorial gains, particularly in, in the north of the country. And they may believe, they probably believe, that they have the, the government on the back foot and that they can sue for a settlement which is really just between them and Saudi Arabia, which they argue is, is the real, their real antagonist in this, this conflict. The Hadi government, meanwhile, Many officials in, in our interviews will admit that entering into negotiations with the Houthis right now would simply create a pathway to, to Houthi power. Um, because they're in this weak, they're in this demoralized position, particularly after events in, in recent weeks, like the, the loss of um, Radman al Awad in Al-Beda and Hadabo in, in Socotra. We also have the exclusion of potential spoilers. We have all these groups on the ground who want to sustain autonomy, or in the case of the STC, want to engineer outright independence for the South. If a political settlement is reached and a ceasefire is reached that doesn't meet their interests or is contrary to their interests, they can spoil this, this, um, this settlement. And finally, we have the, the potential for an unbalanced political settlement. We have two parties with uh, centralizing instincts who want to bring control, <coughs> pardon me, back to Sana'a. Um, and we have multiple parties on, on the ground who would be essential to sustaining a peace process, not just the armed groups, not just the spoilers. We're talking about activists, local youth groups. We're talking about local councils, governments, tribes, so on and so forth, who would be the glue who held Yemen together in the event of a peace process, who would be left out. Um, and naturally, when people are excluded from a settlement, it's less representative. So really, really quickly, I'm going to blast through our, our recommendations. Um, <clears throat> first, expand participation, as April says. Um, secondly, reach an agreement that recognizes ground truths. Third, learn from the past and prioritize bread and butter issues and local oversight mechanism. And fourth, pretty simple, ensure international backing. I'm just going to dig in more detail into the, the first two points on expanded participation and on um, ground truths. On expanded participation, we don't go out there and say, this is 100% what you, you do. We're not prescriptive. We offer a series of options from the, the most to the, the least radical. One option that's, that's sort of under discussion that people are attempting to make happen is to make the government umbrella genuinely inclusive, bring in not just the SDC, but other Southern groups, representatives of key political parties. So when the government goes into talks with the Houthis, they are a credible counterparty as a representative of the full weight of, of anti-Houthi groups. There have been a lot of challenges in making that happen. So what we also offer as an option is that the UN envoy expands participation using his, his mandate. And that really would likely require though explicit UN backing through a new Security Council resolution, which could be as simple as simply saying sort of a multi-party settlement is needed for Yemen more parties need to be included and in making sure that the, the envoy is specifically given the mandate to expand participation. Um, and we also offer more blended options. 
So for example, we talk about sort of who could be included. Again, we're not prescriptive. We don't say who should be included, but we talk about the National Dialogue Conference of 2012 through 2014, which had a certain set of quotas that could be a guide with some modifications to account for, for new and emergent groups. You could add a limited number of key groups to official talks and augment with a consultative group. And you can amplify inform the formal talks through the inclusion of a set of track two policy priorities. Um, in terms of an agreement that recognizes grand, grand truce, what this really speaks to is our fear that in the event of what will always be an imperfect political settlement, we will see an attempt to rapidly recentralize governance functions um, in, in Sana'a. And this isn't because we don't want to see uh, an effective, strong, useful state in Yemen that works to the benefit of all Yemenis. It's because of this fear that the country is so fragmented and that really we sort of end up with like so many armed groups, so many interests and perspectives that our belief is that we need an initial limited settlement that doesn't straight away lead to a rapid handover of weapons and territory, but does create a framework and a pathway to those things happening. A new central government with a limited number of cabinet posts and authorities, so focus on security, fiscal and mon monetary policy, salary payments, services, foreign affairs and trade, and then empowered local authorities under existing Yemeni law, possibly at the governorate level, um, and then a new transition to settle outstanding issues and to try and reintegrate the different parts of the country and bring the, the issue, for example, of, of the South to the table and have it discussed in, in a mature manner. Um, I've overrun on my time um, as ever, so I will, I will wrap things up and I really look forward to comments and our, our Q&A session. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and we'll move right along. And uh, so we, we have invited uh, two external panelists to uh, comment uh, on uh, Peter's presentation, particularly but on the report uh, that we recently published. And the first uh, of these two is uh, Nadwa al Dawsari, and I'm very pleased to, to invite you and to give you the floor now. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for, uh, for the invite. Um, I, I thought the report was really good, well written. Um, it, it, it did an excellent job in describing the dilemma in the current peace negotiations compared to the realities on the ground that have evolved um, over the past few years. It also did a fantastic job in bringing the perspectives of the different Yemeni actors and the com complexity of the internal dynamics and the agendas that drives each side's decisions. Um, in particular, what I really appreciate in the report is that it, uh, it focused on the importance of inclusion of other local forces, uh, such as in Marib, Jawf, Shabwa, Hadramaut, Mahara, Ta'ez, basically all the areas have that have been systematically marginalized for decades. Um, really, really good level of details. Um, <clears throat> so I'll jump to my comments on the recommendations. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the report proposed different scenarios and Peter uh, explained them. Um, one of them was the consultations with wide, wider range of actors using NDC quota as a, as a rough guide uh, to, to to build consensus on uh, in, in respect to a transition, transitional governing arrangement. Um, and also talked about the track to dialogue to be distilled as policy recommendations, uh, freezing hostilities without initial handover of weapons. And also I talked about Houthis withdraw um, some of their forces from the capital to allow a transitional government to be seated in Sana'a. I mean, in theory, some of these things are, are, are good, um, but in practice, I, I just find it really hard to imagine that they, they will be, uh, they will materialize. Um, I mean, and boy, do they sound familiar. I mean, we've, we've been there before, um, how to get the Houthis to honor these agreements. Um, and given their history, the Houthis have failed to honor every agreement they've signed with different political actors and, and even the tribes. Um, so looking at the NDC, NDC was quite representative. Um, Houthis were represented in the NDC. It was inclusive with women, youth, governorate level uh, uh, actors also participated in the NDC. Um, but Houthis were expanding south of Sada. They captured Hajja, al Jawf, and Amran, all while they, have, they were participating in the NDC. Um, 
And when they took Sana'a, the UN envoy forced parties to sign the peace and partnership agreement with the Houthis. Uh, and according to that agreement, Houthis were supposed to withdraw from Amran and Jauf. And instead, they went to Baida literally the next day of signing the agreement. Um, they put Hadi and the cabinet under arrest and they launched war on the rest of Yemen. Um, so given their track record, the question is how to protect a government in Sana'a from the Houthis. Um, and also talking about the ceasefire or freezing of hostilities, um, every ceasefire in the past was an opportunity for the Houthis to regroup and relaunch even a, a more aggressive offensive. Uh, the Stockholm Agreement, um, the Houthis used that uh, the Stockholm Agreement to uh, redirect forces east and south. Uh, they expanded into Bala at the end. Uh, they also um, uh, captured Al Jof and are now relentlessly trying to capture Marib, uh, the last safe zone uh, for many Yemenis, for, for millions of Yemenis. So, how to convince the Houthis to abide by ceasefire agreements? Uh, that's a question. Um, which brings me also to the proposal of a new UN Security Council to update the resolution uh, 2216. Um, and the report says it's about uh, adding language for inclusivity, and that's good. But I want to warn, and, and I'm voicing out uh, a lot of people that I talked to over the past few years, a few days, sorry, Yemenis. Uh, I, I want to warn about any update on the resolution that redefines who the actors are, where it recognizes the Houthis as a legitimate political force without them giving serious concessions. Um, doing that will basically reward their violence um, and succumb to their demands. Um, and what message does that send to Yemenis? Uh, if you're violent, you would be recognized. Um, it also risks complicating things further uh, and planting seeds for even more aggressive conflicts in the future. Um, so what I really like in the report, and this was the highlight of the report, um, that it focused on uh, n not rushing into a centralized government. If, if there is one lesson learned from previous uh, peace negotiations and agreements, it's this one. Um, the report forced, focused on, uh, the report talked about empowering local institutions at the governorate level uh, that are largely largely preserve today's devolved power structures rather than rushing into formal, forming a central government. And I think that will be key to peace in the future. Um, but I, I don't know if, if it would be easy, if, if that will be easy done in Houthi control areas who um, you know, run governorates through their own supervisors uh, who over, uh, overpower local authorities. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, again, this, this focus on not rushing into forming a centralized government is really, is, is, is the one thing I, I really liked in, in the recommendations. Um, I like also the focus on the, so the proposal to focus on bread and butter issues. That's, that's critical and I think all parties should, should co cooperate with that. Um, so I, I have two more comments on the report, and these are not related to the recommendations. Um, they're related to the content. I, I thought the report um, downplayed the, Iran's link to the Houthis um, uh, by presenting selective facts uh, and ignoring other facts. Um, and I get it. You know, we want to convince the U.S. administration not to support Saudi's war in Yemen uh, by basically uh, implying or saying that the Iran's threat in Yemen is, is perceived not real. Um, but that would be misleading because Iran's threat in Yemen is real, it's not perceived. Um, and Houthi's connection to Iran is strong and it's ideological. Um, talking about um, a possible split between the Houthis and Tehran is kind of delusional. Um, and this section depicts Iran and Houthis to be more pragmatic than they are. Um, the other section that I, I also thought was, uh, I, have, I have a comment on was also um, the section on UAE. I thought this section also downplayed UAE's role in Yemen, almost depicting its role as a positive one. Um, you know, from 
saying that UAE reduced its direct military engagement to that it's focused on counterterrorism in, in Shabuah and Hadramaut now. Uh, but we all know that UAEs, while they withdrew, they also, they're still indirectly involved in Yemen uh, through their armed proxies. Uh, and these armed proxies were instrumental in uprooting the government uh, from Aden. Uh, not to mention that UAE directly stroke government forces killing 300 Yemeni soldiers. Um, so, so effectively what the UAE did was dividing anti-Houthi forces. Um, and the report explained that by UAE fear of Islah, but I, I think that that doesn't, um, that also shouldn't uh, make us neglect that the role has been destructive to a large extent. Um, so I, I will leave it here and um, I'll be happy to answer questions. And thank you. Thank you, Nadwa. That was really helpful. Uh, and we will um, certainly address some of the points you have raised. We'll give Peter a chance. Uh, some of the attendees have already raised similar questions, so I'll group them later. But first we move on to Ambassador Barbara Boudin. Barbara, welcome. Nice to see you here. I think you're paying me back for, for something I once did for you at Princeton. Um, I know you're not paying me back. Um, very happy to have you here and to weigh in, uh, especially coming um, from where you are or have been uh, on the US, but with your experience as, as a US ambassador in the region and in Yemen in particular. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you, Joost. Um, and, and thank you to the, the crisis group for this, this opportunity. Uh, to, to, I would say share a stage, but I guess I'm sharing a Zoom, a Brady Bunch, uh, with I think some of the, the most uh, well-informed and thoughtful observers on what's going on in Yemen. Um, I'm, thank you very much. Uh, the report, I agree with Nadwa, uh, the report is superb um, in outlining the state of play in Yemen, um, and especially sorting out all the various domestic and, and regional players' agendas, strengths, and weaknesses. Uh, for anybody who is, is on, this, uh, on this meeting, who wants to understand Yemen better, particularly if you're in the US government, um, please read this report. It's a superb primer. Um, it's easy, I think, for people new to Yemen to get lost in the thicket of domestic players. Um, we prefer nice black and white Manichaean uh, civil wars, and this one is anything but. Um, I would simply say to those getting into Yemen uh, through this report that to the extent that you get lost in the thicket of domestic players, uh, you are on the cusp of wisdom. Um, anybody who thinks that Yemen is simple simply doesn't understand it. So uh, the complexity is one of the strengths. Um, I very much appreciated that it was, can the report is candid about the critical challenges of the compounded fragmentation in Yemen, geographic and political, within the anti-Houthi forces, um, between the two regional, major regional players, between even the UN envoy and what he needs from the Security Council and then the geographic fragmentation itself. It was also, um, I think, remarkably candid uh, on the limits of Hadi and his government, uh, which absolutely have international legitimacy, but have had a hard time really developing uh, legitimacy on the ground. Um, and to assert any kind of real legitimacy. Um, and the limits of Saudi Arabia, who we keep looking to, to be one of the saviors, to effectively act as a driver of, of resolution. Um, the Saudis um, are lack capacity. Um, I think they lack some credibility. They have not been able to make the Riyadh agreement stick um, the Saudis are not known for having an end game or an exit strategy or a comprehensive strategy within, within which they're operating. And I think, you know, the trope that the Saudis have unlimited wealth and therefore unlimited ability to rebuild Yemen 
um, not just with oil prices, but you may have noticed that in the last day or so, they just tripled their VAT tax um, because they're not doing well economically. Um, one caveat I have about the report is that the piece seems to focus very much on a cease on the ceasefire and obviously addressing the worst of the, the economic and social issues. Um, but I think that risks getting us into a South Sudan like uh, situation where we have ended the war and the fighting and the carnage and the humanitarian um, repercussions, but it doesn't really get you to that political solution to be sustainable. Um, I do agree with some of the basic recommendations on bread and butter that, you know, if we don't have a central bank, which is just continuing to fragment and the STC's recent actions in aid and don't help, um, salaries, critically important, lifting the various blockades, um, critically important, and absolutely agree that working on local, small and medium reconstruction rather than grand projects is the right way to go. Um, and also agree with the idea that, you know, to over recentralize without recognizing the role of local uh, governance, local players, um, and the fragmentation is a prescription for failure, which has to be balanced off about against, you know, a, a concern I think some people would have that if it's too decentralized, you're fragmenting the country and possibly again moving to, to almost like a warlordism. Um, what I found missing in the report um, is, is why this matters, why Yemen, why peace in Yemen matters. Uh, for those of us who know Yemen, who've lived in Yemen, are Yemeni, uh, concerned about it, we understand why this is important. Um, and those whose you know, profession is to resolve conflicts, absolutely. But the international community and the major governments um, haven't internalized all of this and they don't understand why this is important to do. Um, Yemen's curse has been, it has been consistently overshadowed by other conflicts in other places. Uh, the Syria conflict for one, Libya increasingly, what's going on in Iraq, what's going on in Iran, what's going on between Iraq and Iran. Um, and then you add COVID. And so how do we get the community's attention that this is not a later issue. Um, this recognition that funds are gonna be uh, critical, absolutely, the wonderful UN report that talked about how Yemen's been set back over 20 years in its development is, is a stark reminder that if we don't get to the bread and butter, if we don't get to the redevelopment, um, it's not gonna work. Yemen was one of the lowest per capita recipients of assistance before the war. The idea that it's going to be a major recipient after the war would be nice, but I think that's very naive. Um, to expect Saudi Arabia to foot the bill um, gives a whole new meaning to the pottery barn dictum. You break it, you buy it. Um, but it seems they have the capability and the capacity to do development projects, which they don't. They're very good at budget support and having them support the Yemeni budget and the, and the reserves, critically important. But expecting them to do the redevelopment, that's not in their skill set. Um, the idea that it would be wise and nuanced and address the local issues that not were very well outlined, that's not something they've demonstrated. Um, it assumes they're gonna have the funds, the oil market, doesn't support that. Um, and it assumes that Saudis, if they take the lead or are given the lead, are not going to try to create a Yemen in their image and likeness, which I don't think is something that most Yemenis want. Um, we can expect them to, uh, to uh, resume budget support, but not the reconstruction itself. And I think this kind of leads to a World Bank-like consortium. Um, 
I fully endorse the key thesis of a broader range of, of players have to participate. There's no question about that. Um, whatever the glaring weaknesses that all of the parties have, um, there is um, an Arab regional dictum about better having the camel in the tent. And I, we don't have to finish that, but I think we need to have a camel in the tent. Um, I am a little concerned that there is, and I've kind of alluded to this, that it's a little bit too much the guys with guns, um, of which there are too many. And I think one of the nuances that I would like to hear Peter talk about is how do you either separate out or have parallel tracks where you're working on a meaningful ceasefire, which is critical, but you're also moving forward on the political and social. One of the things that we learn the hard way, if we've learned it at all in Iraq and Afghanistan, is that if you wait for security before you move to politics and economics, you never get there. Uh, there has to be more of a parallelism and that involves different players. Um, so how do you make these parallel tracks work? Um, I would like to see something more about Yemeni women and youth and how you bring them in. I don't need to uh, talk to everyone else that you, um, on the statistics, if women are included uh, in peace uh, settlements, they tend to be more viable. They were active in Change Square. They were active in the National Dialogue Conference. They've been very active locally. And you ignore Yemeni women at your peril. Um, if you want it to work, you've got to get them more involved. And the same can be said for you. Um, I agree that the National Dialogue is probably a better baseline, but not a template for moving forward. So what does all this mean for the US? Well. Curiously and appropriately, the U.S. doesn't figure anywhere in your report. Um, a little bit of talk about Secretary Kerry's efforts in Kuwait and some on Congress's increasing frustration with the Saudis. Um, but this administration is absent on Yemen. Um, and actually, that may be a good thing. Uh, this administration's track record on uh, successful negotiations with difficult people on thorny issues is a little bit thin. Uh, so having us involved probably would not move things forward. They're also shown an incredible reluctance to fund any kind of reconstruction anywhere, including places where we have been engaged. And they're a little bit preoccupied for the next four months with our campaign. There are no easy wins in Yemen, we know that. There's no easy wins, there's no cheap wins, and there's no quick wins. And so the White House is not going to be the least bit interested in Yemen. And much of their base couldn't find Yemen on a map. Um, if the road goes through, if the road to peace goes through Riyadh, um, this administration is not inclined to put pressure on Riyadh to do anything that Riyadh doesn't want to do. Um, and so I think in many ways, the best thing that the United States can do, at least in the short term, is do no harm. Um, to the extent the Saudis are leaning in, lean on them a little more. To the extent the Emiratis are leaning in on the Saudis, lean on them a little more. But um, you really don't want us directly involved because we really can't do it anymore. Um, more broadly, um, I have a much more pessimistic view about the U.S. role because the broader issue would be to solve the regional rivalries that help fuel this war, uh, to ratchet down the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, to repair the GCC. All of those would be things that would help create a better environment for all of this, but they're not within the worldview of our current administration. Um, and as I was kind of going through this and putting together my remarks, which I'm concluding now, um, I think that basically uh, the U.S. has ceased to be a potential pro productive or constructive player in how the Yemen uh, conflict winds down and how Yemen is rebuilt. Um, it may even be that our time has passed in the region. Uh, the American Lake 
uh, may no longer be an American lake and the perception in many countries in the region that we have, even if it's perceived, just walked away, I think takes us out of this game. Uh, and it's going to have to move to the UN and it's going to have to move to some quiet diplomacy on our part to not get in the way. But, um, you know, we've basically gone from being indispensable to inconvenient but unavoidable player. And I think that has to be taken into account as we're looking at how do you work with the parties within and the parties without on this um, peace effort. Thank you ever so much, uh, Barbara. Um, so we are moving now to, to the uh, question and answer period. Uh, we only have about maybe less than half an hour. Uh, so um, it's going to be a little bit uh, tough. Uh, I know uh, many people have already sent in questions. There's no line. So just uh, type in your questions in the Q&A and we will make a selection and group some together uh, in order to um, maximize the time that we have. Um, you can also send by email if you want to webinars at crisisgroup.org. If you would like to make a live audience Audio, audio, I'm sorry, intervention. You can say so in the Q&A, but there's absolutely no promise from our part that we will let you do it because we simply don't have the time. Uh, but if we, uh, if we see a particularly succinct question, uh, then we, we will happily unmute you uh, for, for, for opposing only that question. Uh, it would have to be really short. Um, finally, um, um, uh, no, not finally. Please, please keep sending in questions and I will turn immediately to, um, uh, to the questions we have already received. Um, and in particular, I want to uh, go to Ambassador Mohammed Al-Hassan of uh, the, the um, Omani ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, he said, um, and I'll re read it here from the Q&A, you have talked about what is needed uh, addressing uh, uh, the entire panel and required from the Yemenis and the UN to bring Yemen closer to peace. But we cannot ignore the presence and role of external powers. What is required from those external powers to help facilitate bring Yemen closer to peace? What is the role of the GCC, for example? Can they play a role in the future of Yemen? In terms of incentives to encourage Yemenis uh, to stride forward towards peace, um, the future relationship between Yemen and the GCC, rebuilding of Yemen. What, what, uh, what, uh, what is your view on this? And um, when we're talking about external players, let's talk, we just heard about the United States, but also earlier we heard about Iran. Uh, Nadva mentioned a link, uh, which is obviously there between Iran and the Houthis. Iran uh, it can be a spoiler, but Iran, Iran maybe is also part of the, has to be part of the solution, being one of the key actors. What exactly could that be? And then, of course, there is uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis. Uh, Nadva mentioned that we perhaps understated the role of the Emiratis. Are they still there? What are they doing? Are they uh, still trying to affect the situation on the ground through proxies? Or, in, or have they, in fact, turned toward a more uh, a role towards uh, bringing uh, peace? So I think it's, uh, these are questions for the entire panel. And I would just like each of you very briefly, really very briefly, to address this particular question, and then we move to other questions. Peter. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Nadwa, thank you to, to Barbara. Um, uh, I said the other day that I wanted to have my feet held to the, the fire, and I, I feel like we got a little bit of that, which I'm very happy about. Um, I'm gonna talk really quickly about the, the regionalization piece and the, the role of the, the GCC. Um, as ever with, with these reports, I do invite people to, to read the, the text. Um, we spend a lot of time talking to a lot of people, including the regional actors involved in, in the conflict. And what we try to produce a lot of the, the time is both the perspectives of the, the parties themselves, including the, the regional actors. We have to say what they, they tell us. And then we have to kind of sum up our overall assessment and, and summary. So on Iran, um, if you read the report, we talk through sort of the, the growing base of evidence. There's no question that Iran and indeed Hezbollah um, have been supporting the Houthis for some time, that that support is increasing. Um, we don't give an overall assessment, but we do say it's deepening and it will continue to deepen over, over time. 
on the on the UAE, um, uh, we we again sort of talk about the the full range of groups and the fact that sort of most of the anti Houthi groups not directly within sort of the the Hadi government bloc tend to be um, affiliated with or or in some cases to be products of, of the UAE inter intervention. Um, and the UAE is, is going to be an important player in all of this for some time to, to come, um, as is Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I completely take um, Ambassador Bodine's point on Saudi Arabia's um, willingness to, to put the, the funds required to rebuild Yemen up front. We, we really question that and we do go into that a little bit in the report, particularly in a COVID environment. The idea that you're going to have people stump up tens of billions of dollars in future for the reconstruction of Yemen, I think is questionable. Um, I think an international trust fund would be a good way to, to move forward as, as the ambassador says. Um, but one of the reasons that we point to the idea of a limited government with a limited remit um, and decentralization a focus on localized projects really is this idea that the amount of resource made available to Yemen in a post-conflict context is not gonna be commensurate with actual needs. So we need to focus and prioritize on how do you get the economy moving and how do we make sure that people at the local level, people at the rural level who have suffered the most from this conflict are given the greatest amount of assistance at, at the, the outset. In terms of external powers, a role for the GCC, obviously since 2017, it's been extremely challenging to have the, the GCC um, play a role as an, an institution with the, the full sort of powers of, that the institution had um, before, before the, the, the Gulf Rift. Um, in particular in, in Yemen now, um, something that we don't delve into in, in the report and in real detail um, are accusations that other players are now becoming involved in, in Yemen, Qatar and, and Turkey, both of whom of course didn't deny this, but at the same time, there are increasing signals that there is a new regionalized aspect of the conflict, which makes it even more mm -hmm. complex. So the GCC as an institution, I, I struggle to see how it, it would work in such a polarized environment, but we do need to see diplomacy expanded to deal with all of these points. One of the things that we've called for for some time as crisis group is the formation of an international contact group that sets a, a specific roadmap for what it feels it needs to achieve um, and divides labor between its members over time and attempts to achieve those things as happened during the transition of 2012 to 2014 with you know qu questionable success but some results so bringing all the international parties into a room together getting them to talk to each other having them follow up regularly having it under the, the auspices of the un special envoy we think would be a way forward for an agreement on what the international approach should be to Yemen rather than this slightly more fractured fragmented approach that we we have right now so I think that might be the the better solution than the GCC yeah um if if I could jump in Please. um yeah and if you can hear the construction sounds that just launched outside my house please let me know and I'll pick up and move um I completely agree that international contact contact group and um, also a development consortium is is the best way to to help Yemen, since there aren't any single players or small regional groups of players who can do this. Um, and that Iran has the ability to either be a spoiler or part of the solution. Um, which is why I also went back to Saudi, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. I think the one way that to bring the, either get the Iranians out or to bring them in, and this is something that was tried um, over the last couple of years, is to those whose major concern is our relationship with Saudi Arabia, to make the argument that if you don't want the Iranians to have a foothold in Yemen, you need to help end the war because the longer the war goes on, the more entrenched the Iranians become. So if you've got a 15 foot hole, stop digging. Um, and that would be one way to mitigate the Iranian influence uh, and to be spoilers. In terms of bringing the Iranians in as part of the solution, uh, 
in a different world. Um, if we, many countries, are concerned about Iranian meddling uh, and, and bad acting in the region, and you're trying to get the JCPOA back on track, which I firmly support, um, one of the things the Iranians could very easily give as a way of a confidence building measure, and you, know, you can make your own decision on its sincerity, would be to pull out of its support from Yemen. So there's a couple of ways to, to work on, on the Iranian issue. The GCC, I agree with you, as an institution, it can't do anything. Have a number of other GCC states play positive roles. Mr. Ambassador Oman has been uh, very active in this and um, all of the talk about the Kuwait agreement, so has Kuwait. So individual uh, GCC states, but not the GCC until it weaves itself back together. My concern about an international contract group is a little bit like figuring out who's gonna come to the ceasefire talks. Um, there are so many internal divisions within the GCC, strong divisions within the Security Council that getting the proper players, the spoilers and solvers who can be the same person depending on how they want to act, getting them into the same room and coming up with either a coherent political strategy or a coherent development strategy right now would be extraordinarily difficult. The Russians, the Chinese, the Americans aren't going to get into the same room in a constructive way. Um, the GCCs, you know, so our problem or maybe the solution is Martin Griffith is the only external power player who is, is sufficiently credible with enough to do this, but I don't think he can do it in a formal structure because people will not formally join a group with people they right now are um, in conflict with. Thanks, Barbara. Nadwai, you're on next, and um, a number of questions also uh, for you, and there'll be more in a minute when I get to that. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a question on the link between Iran and the Houthis. Um, I mean, I won't get into much details, but we Yemenis see that on the ground. Uh, the Houthis are trying to redefine Yemen's culture uh, by force. So they're introducing Shia 12 uh, practices, Aid al Ghadir, Al Hussein's murder celebration. Um, their slogan is the slogan of the Iranian revolution and they're forcing this on schools, public facilities, they're indoctrinating children and public workers, forcing them into uh, summer, uh, summer classes. Um, um, and also like when, for examples, well, also like, uh, you know, Houthis have gotten their weapon, weapon making technology from Iran. Um, they're building a police state or they've built a police state akin the Iranian regime controlling people by fear and intimidation. Um, they've, uh, one example, um, whether well, they're part of the axis of, of, of resistance uh, with Iran and, and they're proud of that. Um, also, when Soleimani was, uh, was killed, uh, the Houthis uh, managed to uh, get thousands of their supporters to march in Sana'a for days in, in solidarity. Um, and the, the photos of Iranian leaders and Soleimani were, you know, all over Sana'a. Uh, so these are just a few examples. Um, and there is also the question about the Emiratis. I mean, the Emiratis are still in Yemen. They've reduced size in terms of numbers and weapons, but they have officers on the ground, and these officers still control their proxies on the ground, the, the, the security proxies. Um, and they, they, they still pay the salaries, they still provide the weapons, the training, um, the supplies, and the running costs for these forces. Um, and like you said, uh, Ambassador Boudin, the Emiratis and the Saudis can be uh, spoilers. Uh, they've been spoilers to a large extent. They can also be, uh, they can also use their, their sway and influence over these forces to bring sides together um, to kind of minimize the division uh, among these different actors and, and bring them to come to like common understanding and common agreement 
on the way forward. So thank you, Nadwa. Move, moving forward on the Houthi question, Peter. Um, now, on the ground, the Houthis uh, seem to be the strongest. Um, and so questions have arisen over, you know, the, 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 uh, the likelihood of the Houthis settling for some kind of real peace when they are the strongest. Uh, you know, we're, we may not reach a stage where, where we can say there's a hurting stalemate. Why would the Houthis um, even uh, want to uh, strike a deal? And then uh, Nadwa's earlier question uh, in response to the, to the report, uh, why would they stick to a deal uh, if they even came to one? Um, would they go along or would they just use the time to, to regroup and, uh, and relaunch uh, attacks as they have done in the past? Peter, you want to uh, address that? Sure. The, the really easy question that, that everyone wants um, to answer in, uh, in five bullet points or, or less. Look, I, one of the things that, that I, I hope we make clear in the report is the extent to which the Houthis are, are mistrusted. And when we interview people anywhere outside of Houthi controlled territory, they make the exact point that the number does, which we bring into the report, um, which is their belief that the Houthis only enter into negotiations um, in order to um, regroup, in order to improve their, their position and that they don't stick to deals. And of course, the, the Houthis completely deny this. They say it's the, the other side that always doesn't stick to deals, so on, so, so forth. Um, and the, the reality is, is I, I mean, the, the PMPA is something that a lot of people come back to. Um, the Peace and National Partnership Agreement of September 2014, which what people thought was meant to stop the, the Houthi Sala takeover of the, the North, but in fact was sort of more of a prelude to further territorial expansion and, and takeover of, of the state. And certainly this is a point that we, we take to our Houthi interlocutors. And when we argue the case for a political settlement and a deal with them right now, a point that we bring on across again and again is that they need to demonstrate to the other side their willingness to um, engage in a compromise position of some kind to allow other voices into, into the, the room, which I know doesn't answer the, the, the question entirely. But the other point that I, I want to come back to, and it's one that we, we make as clearly as we can in the report, is this sense that we're in a race against time. And April said this in, in the video. And our, our big concern right now is that there are plenty of reasons for everyone involved to delay the move towards a political settlement including the Houthis. But if we see a continuation of the trends that we've seen over the course of the conflict, one is sort of the, the downward trend, and that is the atomization of anti-Houthi groups and the lack of coherence in terms of the, the platform of a counterparty to the Houthis in political negotiations that can come and be a credible counterparty to the Houthis. And the other is the upward trend of Houthi control and power on the ground. And we're also clear in the report in saying that the Houthis are probably the strongest group on the ground, but that does not make that put them in a position where they can take over the, the entire country as, as they might, might believe. They still have to negotiate with others. And the argument that we, we bring to them is, is that they, they have told us that they want a, a small deal. Basically, they want a deal between themselves and um, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Um, with some Hadi government in involvement likely to end the war and then they want Yemeni Yemeni negotiations. Um, and we, we've really pushed this point that moving towards negotiations now with a wider array of groups is the, the best way to go. That's simply because it moves us towards a place where, where sort of the core differences are, are recognized and where they demonstrate their ability to do some of this compromising that, that they're not perceived to do. In terms of the, the government and anti-Houthi groups, the argument that we bring for, we've been bringing forward is that the government is not seen at the moment as an entirely plausible or credible counterparty to the Houthis for a variety of reasons that I think we all understand. But the bringing more groups in to the, the talks would likely create a block with the government pretty much at, at its center, which would be a negotiating counterparty to the Houthis, um, which would allow them more credibility in negotiations to push an agenda which balances 
the Houthis out a little bit. But the, the final point I'm, I'm going to make is, is this. We make it, I hope, clear again in the report. We're not talking about perfection in, in Yemen. And I truly wish that we were. Um, I think anyone who knows me and knows the, the crisis group team working on Yemen knows that sort of we don't do this for um, the, the millions of dollars and the, the prestige. We do it because of um, a deep and abiding affection for the, the country. Um, we'd love to see a perfect political settlement, but our genuine fear is that if the, these two con trend lines continue over the course of another three or five years, the humanitarian cost of the, the conflict gets worse, the fragmentation gets worse, the, the chaos among um, sort of the anti-Houthi bloc gets worse. Um, so what, what we're pushing for is something that, yeah, stops the, the bleeding for now and it gives us a chance to see if political compromise is possible. But we also make it clear that there's a fair chance that that, that fails, that that collapses. But if it gives us a chance to see if it's, it's doable, I think that it's, it's worth it and it doesn't really change things on, on the ground. But I know that that's not offering sort of the, the ultimate perfect settlement that we'd, we'd all like to see in Yemen. Yeah. yeah. Um, Barbara, I'm coming to you anyway. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that, that was actually a scratch. So sorry. Um, it, there is no... Barbara, sorry, I have a, a question for you. You're on mute, uh, I think, someone. The, um, uh, in addition to what you're going to say to Peter, uh, can you uh, weigh in on the question of, uh, of a new Security Council resolution, the likelihood of it? And, and who do you think could, would have the uh, leverage among the external players or even internal to make the parties in Yemen shift their priorities away from maximalist demands? Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the easy questions that Peter doesn't get, I get. Um, there is no such thing as a perfect peace agreement. Uh, and um, so I think those of us who, who have worked in this field uh, understand that we have to go with what is the best possible as long as there are not so many compromises that you're not actually getting peace, you're just getting a temporary ceasefire. Is that I think many of us want to avoid the South Sudan model. Um, and it is absolutely, you know, the race against time that you've outlined. Um, I would be with you tomorrow on the ground if I thought that I could do something useful uh, to move this along. Um, but the one, question, one part is the idea of bringing all the anti-Houthi forces together um, under Hadi, uh, to me, just doesn't really sound viable, uh, given Hadi's own status and given the very different agendas. And the first thing that came to mind as you were talking about this, it sounded a little bit like the joint meeting party where we tried to bring together the socialists and Islam and all the anti-Sala parties uh, to have an effective block against him. And what you end up with is gridlock. Um, I'm not saying I have an alternative to your idea, but I'm just a little concerned that, you know, it, it won't actually move it forward. It will just rephrase it. Um, how do you get a new UN Security Council resolution and who could drive it? Um, it's not going to come from us. Uh, we don't want it coming from the Russians uh, or the Chinese, and I don't think that they would do it. The one the one way to get a new Security Council resolution is to maybe go back to how we got 2216 in the first place. And that would be getting the Saudis and the Emiratis, and there's going to be a lot of diplomacy behind what I'm about to propose. There's a lot of diplomacy behind this. Get the Saudis, Emiratis, and others who table 2216 to come in with the alternative. That would give it a legitimacy. Now this means that the Saudis need to get to the point where they recognize there's no military agreement. They have, you know, there's a lot of building blocks behind that. But a new UN security re resolution would have to recognize rather than try to create a new framework. There has to be an understanding of a new framework and then the Security Council 
would endorse it. The idea of the Security Council, and I can't think of anyone who could go to it outside of the regional parties uh, and come up with this new framework and then have it recognized, I don't see. So the 2216.2.0 is going to have to reflect the Emiratis, the Saudis, and others accepting your excellent report and saying, okay, this is what we want to do with Martin Griffith walking along with them. That's the only way I can see to a new UN Security Council resolution, although most people recognize that it is a deeply flawed resolution. It's who puts it forward. It's going to have to be the same people who gave us 2216. Yes, and, and maybe if we didn't won't see a hurting stalemate between the Houthis and other Yemeni actors. We may be able to see a hurting stalemate between the Houthis on the one side and the Saudis and Emiratis on the other. And that could at least set a context for an internal Yemeni peace. Now, I want to come to you about the internal Yemeni peace. Um, uh, there is a question about uh, the role of the tribes, and I know you've done a lot of work on that uh, yourself. And um, also on uh, whether uh, a gender inclusive peace uh, is is uh, possible in Yemen under the current circumstances? I'm asking you this question because I would have asked Peter as well, but we, I know we're working on some uh, some uh, report or uh, commentary on this already. So um, I would like to hear your your view on this. Um, and there's been a question about whether a peace in Yemen um, can be imposed from the outside, or maybe facilitated, mediated from the outside, or really has to come from the inside up. Your views, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, the tribes uh, have been doing peace every day in Yemen. Uh, first of all, this is a this is a country of active conflict, uh, and the fact the matter of fact is that in most Yemen, it's the tribes that provide security, justice, maintain uh, uh, road security, uh, and in, in many instances, cooperate with local security forces to in, to address security problems. It's the tribes that have been doing that. So we, we haven't seen the insecurity we've seen in Syria and other areas in Yemen because of Yemeni tribes. Um, and women, women are in, in the heart of peacemaking in Yemen. Um, there are women who have managed to, um, uh, you know, successfully uh, release prisoners um, and force disappeared uh, civilians. Um, some women-led NGOs have done a, a great work in terms of also addressing the issue of child soldiers. Uh, there is a huge potential with civil society organizations and women, and they, they need to be brought in, that's for sure. Um, and the question about, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to be, uh, you know, uh, pay attention to the time. In terms of can peace be brought in from the outside? Absolutely not. Uh, peace can happen only when Yemenis decide that it's enough and we need to kind of coexist with each other. Uh, regional actors can either facilitate peace or prevent it. Um, it's, it's up to them what they choose to be. And in this case, I would point out at two main regional actors, which is the Saudis and the Emiratis, but also the Iranians. Thank you, Natwa. We have uh, less, just over one minute left. And I was going to give each of you one minute to, to for some concluding remarks. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Nadwa, do you have uh, something to add to what you just said uh, in conclusion? Yes. Um, so I would warn against accepting a deeply flawed peace than no peace, because a deeply flawed peace can make the conflict 10 times worse. And we've, we've done that before. We've been there. We tried. The, the GCC initiative was a, deep, the deeply, a deeply flawed peace plan that led us to the war. And now doing another deeply flawed peace um, is not going to achieve peace. So I, I, I would just warn against like half solutions. Excellent, thank you, Nadwa. Um, Barbara. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, this has been fabulous. Um, I agree 90% with Nadwa on most things. Um, and I certainly agree that a deeply flawed peace, and I keep using the South Sudan as, as, as my example, a deeply flawed peace, um, particularly one that is almost ceasefire only and recognizes 
realities on the ground, yes, but does it freeze realities on the ground so that there's no forward movement? That is worse. But there's a difference between a deeply flawed piece and an imperfect piece. Um, and I think trying to find what is that imperfect but acceptable uh, piece that leads to transition that avoids the flaws of a deeply, of a fatally flawed piece, you know, that's, that's what we do for a living is trying to do that. We have not been successful. Um, and I totally agree that, you know, it cannot be imposed uh, from the outside. Um, the regional actors, the international actors can help. They can support, uh, they can help fund in some cases, um, they can move, move it forward um, or they can mess it all up. Um, but this is gonna have to be something where the international community, the regional community creates the space uh, for the Yemenis to be able to work out the post ceasefire political, social and economic transition in a way that meets the Yemeni realities on the ground. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. Peter, last word to you, but uh, really no more than one minute. Sure. Um, so yes, I agree with both of you, um, a completely or deeply flawed piece um, which is just for expediency will not work. And what we propose is, is less a, an imperfect um, piece uh, as the beginning of an imperfect process that moves us towards something like peace. Yemen, even if the, the shooting stops tomorrow, will not be at peace the, the day after. Um, and we have to accept that, that reality. So what we're proposing is trying to find another way to resolve this, move the political confrontation in, sorry, the military confrontation into a political confrontation. Um, and we do believe that given the trend lines that we see in the country, this is the, the best way forward, but we also completely understand that others will, will disagree and will hold out for something better. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for being so concise. Um, thank you to, uh, to all the panelists, to Nadwa Adausari, to Ambassador Barbara Boudin, and to Peter, of course, and to April, who is uh, watching from the sidelines uh, this time. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent uh, uh, panel and for the, for the wonderful discussion we've had. I have to apologize to the many attendees. We had uh, over 300 people. It was impossible to come to all of your questions, but um, uh, please do, and we have a record of your questions and we may come back to you on some of these. Um, and uh, don't, please uh, don't hesitate to send us your questions directly. Any comments you have on the report or on this event, send them by email uh, to, uh, uh, to Peter, I suppose. Uh, he will uh, happily uh, uh, report them, or to any of the uh, other panelists, um, uh, as you like, uh, or just to, to Crisis Group, and you can get to us via our website. So um, uh, I leave it at this. Thank you so much for coming and hope to see you again soon for another Crisis Group event. Thank you. Bye-bye.